Hi and welcome to our Together We Are One Firm event. Uh, apologies for starting a few minutes late. We are having a slight tech issue with one of our presenters. So thank you so much for bearing with us. Um, my name is Asha Tiku. I am one of the graduate recruitment managers here in our London office. Um, and we are really excited to welcome you today to this unique one of its kind uh, event, first of its kind event, um, which we are delighted to be hosting in conjunction with several of our several of our colleagues from um, our uh, other European offices. Um, as many of you will be aware, our firm is regularly singled out for its cross-border excellence. And most recently, we were named International Law Firm of the Year at the IFLR Europe Awards. We wanted to pull together an event that really brought this to life and gives you an opportunity to meet and engage with the individuals that are working on these groundbreaking projects. So today's session is in three parts. First of all, you'll be hearing from a panel of lawyers and associates that advised on a complex cross border uh, pharma tech acquisition, one of our biggest cross-jurisdictional deals to date. And at this point, I would encourage you to put any questions you have in for the panel in the chat as the uh, presentation is, is going on, as there will be a few minutes at the end dedicated to answering as many of them as we can before time runs out. If we aren't able to get to them all, no fear as they will be an opportunity for you to meet the speakers during the networking session following the presentations. The second part of today's session will be made up of several of our lawyers uh, from a broad range of jurisdictions talking about some of the groundbreaking pro bono projects that we've been working on across Central Europe. We are also delighted to be joined by some of the clients that we are working alongside who will also be able to share their perspectives on the impact of the work we are doing. Finally, following the presentations, there will be an opportunity for you to network with the speakers and some of our colleagues from our international offices, where you can ask more follow up questions about what has been discussed and find out more about the career opportunities that are available across our different regions. These can be accessed from our expo hall. And once the panel presentations have concluded, we will jump back on here and give you instructions on where exactly you need to go. So, without further ado, I will now hand over to Neil Barlow from our US office to introduce to you the Ardian Daedalus deal and kick off the first part of today's session. Over to you, Neil. Thank you. Thank you. And welcome, everybody. It's fantastic to be, uh, we can't see you, but it's fantastic to be with you and, and to, to be with my colleagues on, on the line here. So, I'm about to introduce, I'm a partner in our New York M&A practice. As you can probably tell from my accent, I don't hail from Long Island, but uh, originally come from just outside of London. I joined the firm in 2011 as a trainee in our London office, and I worked in New York, uh, Dubai, and London. And so I'm obviously a bit of a lifer with the firm, love the firm, love the collaboration um, and the global element. And I think when I was in your position, I remember really looking for a firm <clears throat> that was truly global, but by that, that had opportunities to work and collaborate together on cross-border deals, because I just thought, you know, 10, 10, 11 years ago now, everyone was talking about globalization and what did that mean? And would business be coming together in a way that lawyers could actually work across borders? And that's kind of how I've mapped out my career and one of the things that attracted me to this firm. And I, in many ways has led for me to be based in New York as I am today. So what we wanted to do was just spend a bit of a time talking to you about a real life example of how we do this on a day to day basis, because I appreciate that in your position, you may be sitting there and thinking, well, what does an international M&A deal really mean? If I'm sat in a particular geography, what's my involvement? And so we, you know, particularly in my field, I focus on representing private equity investors. So effectively, financial sponsors that um, gather money on behalf of third party investors, and then their role is to go into the market and to buy new businesses or invest in new businesses, or businesses that have been owned by previous owners, develop those businesses, and then at some point in the future, maybe 10, 5, 15 years, sell that on or maybe list it on, you know, the New York, the London, German stock exchanges, what have you, um, and put that business in a better place. So 
I remember thinking when I joined the firm, well, how does this touch on real life? How 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 is what I'm doing impacting on real life? And we had an opportunity on this transaction to, I guess, to to experience how we impacted on real life, and 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 I'll, and I'll explain why. So, we represent a global private equity house called Ardian. Now, Ardian is originally headquartered in Paris and is one of the largest European private equity houses in the world. They're also big in the United States. Now, through our colleagues in Milan, um, we're hoping that one of them, Filippo Isaacca, will be able to join us shortly. He fostered a relationship with the Italian team at Ardian in Milan. And from this, they said, hey, we want to invest in healthcare. And particularly, we want to invest in healthcare tech. Now, <clears throat> a lot of this was happening during the, the, pande- the, the early stages of the pandemic. And so for us as lawyers, this was a great opportunity to be involved with a, a buying a business that was effectively works on the software that helps operating tables, surgeries, the machinery that goes into examining people's health. Um, during during a time when obviously healthcare uh, was at the forefront of everything that was important to the world and and remains so today, and so Ardian went and acquired this business called Dedalus. Now Dedalus is a European business um, based in Italy, and so it made total sense that our Milan colleagues were buying and acting for Ardian in Italy, buying another Italian company. And when Ardian buys a business, because it's a private equity house, it doesn't make too many changes to that business. What it does is it owns all of the shares and then it will put maybe two or three of their investment professionals on the board of that company. And they will manage and help make strategic decisions around the growth of that business. And so what was fantastic here was they bought Dedalus and then they said, Okay, how are we going to improve Dedalus? How are we going to grow it as a, as a business for its employees, for its stakeholders? What does it need? And I think one of the big areas it wanted to focus on was technology, and particularly technology that goes into into the surgery room in in, in hospitals. And so, on on my side of, of the coin, Filippo and our Milan team called us up in New York and said, "Well." Dedalus are looking through Ardian's backing to expand by bu- buying a business that is headquartered in the United States. And so can you help us work on this transaction? And so that's how this really started uh, in terms of the collaboration between uh, Milan and New York. If we can move to the next slide. So just to give you a, a, a bit of a background, that was what we did on, on the US front. Um, but would my other colleagues like to just jump in and talk about the other jurisdictions uh, and their involvement on this picture before we go forward? Yeah, I, I'm happy to take a, uh, talk about a bit about uh, this, Neil. I'm Michilis Walkens, based in, in the Brussels office, an associate here. And you see the number of countries involved in this transaction. Originally, as Neil said, Deadlows was just an Italian business. But through two major transactions on which all of us here present in, in the panel acted, uh, we expand, that business was expanded to, to basically across the globe. So you see Ardian's headquarters being in France, Deadlift's headquarters being in Italy. A couple of countries like Germany, uh, Belgium, uh, or Brazil, where, um, where Deadlift expanded through a first acquisition, so the ACFA transaction, which I'll talk about a, a bit uh, later. And then a couple of countries where uh, Deadlift um, expanded through a second transaction, the uh, DIXC transaction, which Neil and Katharina will talk a bit uh, about. So that's US, I think Spain, UK, Australia. So fr- from a an, from an smaller Italian business in, in a very small amount of time, basically, this became a global business. Um, so Neil, back to you. Great, thank you. And Carolyn, anything to add to that at this point? No, I think I will go that into that direction when, when talking about the healthcare stuff in a minute. <laughs> Thanks. Sure, you. no, that sounds good. So when you think about buying a business, right, what, what does that mean? It, it sounds like big words and a, and a grand scheme, but, but what do we actually mean by doing that? And what expertise does a law firm need to have to, to, to make that happen? And so if you look at the slide we've got up on your screen, um, we, we hit the sort of core areas. Project coordination. 
if you think about what 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 the transactional lawyers actually do a lot of my time is project management it's making sure so it's you know a lot of the role is not necessarily legal it is playing the trusted advisor that can help drive a transaction forward it's the person the client can call and say do you have a team of employment experts in the netherlands do do you have you know regulatory expertise in germany do do you have antitrust lawyers in washington dc and pulling that team together and then making sure and anticipating the timeline that the client has in their mind to actually buying this business because a big component of M&A is about speed. It's about how quickly can you actually execute on buying this business. And the reason I say that is because there are a lot of comp- there's a lot of competition in the market to buy these types of, of businesses. They don't necessarily come up for sale very often. And so it wouldn't just be Ardian saying, oh, hi, I would like to buy this business. <clears throat> there may be 10 or 20 other, other uh, private equity house- houses, or corporate enterprises or pharmaceutical companies that may also want to buy. And so you end up getting into what we call an auction quite often and and a bit of a bidding war. And that's what happened on this deal. You had back and forth between different interested buyers speaking to the sellers to say, well, what price are you going to pay? How do you value the business? And so we as lawyers may not be involved as much at that stage. That would be the buyer and, may, and perhaps the bankers, the investment bankers um, who would look at that picture, right? But as soon as they agree a price and they say, well, we want to go with Ardy and Dedalus to, to buy our company, then really at that stage, <clears throat> they will call us up and say, right, we've got four weeks to execute on this deal. How quickly can you diligence this business? How quickly can you pour a team together? How quickly can you get in a meeting room with us and help us talk about the issues that we should care about when, when we buy this business? And so that project management is a really important bit of what I do in M&A. But then you drill down into the expertise and the real area of the business that people should care about. Uh, Carolyn, were you going to take this next slide as we, as we talk about that expertise? Yeah, exactly. Thanks, Neil. So I think one of the key aspects here, as you as you correctly mentioned, Neil, is speed. But you can only be up to speed, and you can only provide this advice to your client in in a in a timely manner if you're really deeply uh, with. Uh, deeply equipped with your sector knowledge and i think that was really key for, for this audience transaction also for our engagement in that project because we do and that that's uh, what i want to spend a bit uh, um and, and to explain to you um what is special about clifford in, in in this respect is we do have our healthcare group it's one of the three sector groups um in within clifford chance and um i think the in uh, the involvement of the of our sector group our sector knowledge and expertise was really key to get this process done uh for art in, in, a, in a successful way um and so um the question is and that that i want to share with you today is um who, who who are we? Who is the sector group? What 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 can we do? What is our our work? And also, what is our contribution to to that kind of very global and and um, rust transactional work? Um, you can see here on the slide that the the healthcare group is not only healthcare in terms of pharmaceutical and medtech, but we are understand ourselves as a broader team, a broader sector team focused on pharmaceuticals, medical devices, pharma um, pharma border products usually go also into food d- supplements and also cosmetics. So we are a, a center of excellence based in Dusseldorf in Germany, um, covering the cover the co- covering Europe, but also covering a kind of the uh, the hub position for the for the firm globally. So we are experts advising on EU law, but of course we do have our local experts if we do require assistance in, I don't know, French law or UK law. Uh, but that's our collaborative idea of our sector group to have here um, an expert team that is a point of contact, the, the first contact actually for, for clients to go to and then to figure out um, which jurisdiction should be covered and with, with what team we can match up to collaborate on, on these deals and transactions. So thinking about what, 
what is our work actually? Of course, we're doing as we did here in Ardian, uh, these type of transactions and global projects. Um, it's also about collaboration project. It's not only M&A, but it's also if, if two companies go together and develop products and then um, enter into a 20, 30 year collaboration. So it's it's, it's similar project work. But it's also in that that is really important for our sector knowledge. It's advising businesses on their daily operations. So advising pharmaceutical companies or medical device companies on their daily daily questions that they have, and they might reach from research and development to the last end of the product status and product life cycle, which is sometimes product liability cases or um, acquisitions or emerging portfolios. So it's it's really rather diverse. And from that diverse um, uh, broad range of, of matters and advice that we give and provide to our patients, we, we retrieve our deep sector knowledge that we can uh, bring into these deals that we that we currently um, are doing and, and, and sharing with with Ardian. So moving on to the to the next slide, just to give you a flavor on what um, is usually on our table and what what is the, really the, the sector knowledge that we can contribute to these deals. Daedalus is, is claiming itself, and I think they are undisputed, a market leader in healthcare IT already in the Dach region, Italy and France. Um, and by this transaction, um, or the two of them, actually, uh, they try to, to uh, expand their, their geographical reach. But the legal questions, in fact, are exactly the same as you consider that they're into health, IT, health tech, health IT. Um, so it covers... Um, information systems for hospitals, so the HIS uh, software, but it also covers, as Neil uh, pointed out, um, software products um, used in, in, in the surgery room, etc. And um, the legal question from a healthcare and regulatory perspective is, is that a medical device and what requirements need to be c complied with um, for these products? There are a couple of range of questions. I don't want to dig into very much detail here, but um, just to give you an idea, Brexit is a topic to be to be addressed in these types of transactions because what what you do at a time where you don't know how the future collaborations between Britain and and um, the EU will will look like, or if you if you face um, new um, requirements and also um, gaps in regulations because we do have a new European wide regulation that just came into into place um, and. Uh, all the authorities and all the companies were not yet ready to cover it. So how would you tackle these these challenges in a transaction? That's our business and that's where we have great experience and how we can uh, contribute to 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 this speedy process that was that was at stake here. And then lastly, to give you an overview of exactly what we did in this audience transaction, moving on to the next slide, maybe, um, is we covered actually three three processes and, and three stages. The first one was, of course, due diligence. Um, that's the proper legal work that you do. You look, you look at the product, you look at the product and see whether they're uh, in fact fine, where you, whether you can identify any risks. Um, and that's where we can contribute our deep suck to knowledge. The second and the more important one on that is to get this process coordinated and collaborated with the other team. So as Neil pointed out, very different um, work streams are, are working on this deal. And healthcare is one of them, um, and we are we are coordinating this team from from our base in Düsseldorf. But we need to make sure that our questions actually are are um, cover and and get the right interplay with data protection, with employment discussions, etc. So it's all about getting this at the right time to the right people, and um, to have this in a in a very coordinated way. Um, and the last one is. Um, you're not you, our work, so our legal work is not not completed only with the due diligence saying, well, hey, that's fine. It's also about how would you address these aspects of Brexit, of new regulations, of unsecure and uh, uncertainties in terms of product status, future products in your auction process. So, um, how would you bring these findings into the uh, into the actual um, transaction documents at the end? And that was a really close and great collaboration, I guess, with with Euclid, um, as you mentioned, um, to get this deal done in the final stage and to get all these knowledge that we that we compiled in our due diligence over to you and to make this happen at the end. So I think maybe that's that's the um, the point for you to to take over from here. Yeah, that's that's entirely true. I, th I think what we want to do now on, on the next two slides is dig a bit deeper into the two transactions uh, we, we previously referred to. And so the first transaction was what we call the ACFA transaction. It's, um, it's basically the, the first transaction by which Daedalus really expanded its reach. And it was about ACFA Gevaert, a, a Belgian multinational, 
um, act listed here in Belgium and, and active in, in imaging and healthcare, uh, wanting to sell its healthcare IT division in a couple of European and, 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 and other countries um, in an auction process. So, so really, as Neil explained, a competitive process where they want to put competitive pressure between bidders in order to, to get the most in terms of price and conditions um, out, of, out, of, out of the sale. Uh, we were contacted in, in the summer of 2019 uh, when, when ACFA was searching in the market for pot potential bidders and Dedos was interested in, in this business because it was to some extent complementary with the business it already had. And it could allow them to serve more markets, both geographically and, and in terms of products in, in Europe and outside of Europe. But it really kicked off in the end only in, in November 2019. Um, that's when we got access, the entire team that was present here, to, to documents, to information, and we could really start working. And in the end, between the beginning of November, when we really started working, and the 1st of December of 2019, when we signed the transaction successfully, uh, that was only one month. Um, so basically, record speed. And that was really due to the collaboration uh, between our team. And, and let me explain a bit what we did in, in practice and, and, and how we managed that. So the first work stream that we kicked off um, at the beginning of November was due diligence. So that's also what Neil explained is digging into this business, trying to identify legal risks, and then reporting to a client to say, look, th these are the risks that are important and you need to think about, try to cover, try to price into your the offer you will make for this acquisition. And that was coordinated by, by Filippo, who's, who joined us and his team in the Milan office. But they involved teams in Paris, in Brazil, in Germany, in here in Brussels, and in other countries, and they coordinated all of this. Um, then the second work stream was the transaction documents. So that's really the agreements between Daedalus as a buyer and um, ACFA as a seller, uh, by which this entire transaction is governed. So mainly a share purchase agreement, whereby the shares and the target are transferred, but also uh, five other agreements, um, IP agreements, service agreements, to make sure that this business that is sold, this division of ACFA that is sold, it can be standalone after the sale. It's not dependent anymore on ACFA to, to, to work and, and to be independent. Um, and that was led from Brussels because the seller was Belgian. These documents were Belgian law governed. We led that here from the Brussels office, closely coordinating with, with Caroline's team on the healthcare aspects, uh, with, with Filippo's team, on all the uh, to make sure we, we closely coordinate with the client and basically with all the teams um, that are present here. And then the third the third work stream is what Caroline talked about is really the the regulatory side, the healthcare side, which was then managed from Germany by Caroline. So the way we structured this this process, whereby we worked basically on three parts in parallel, allowed us really to work in, in record speed and to be um, in a couple of weeks to get to know this business, to flag the, the risks, and to get to documents and, and agreements with the seller that were satisfying to our clients. Um, and just, just to give you a couple of anecdotes on, um, on, on our collaboration, I think in, in the first week of November, uh, at two days notice or something, we, we were invited to a meeting in Antwerp here in Belgium um, for the due diligence. Um, and Filippo got over from, from Milan. We had a colleague from our Paris office and here, two colleagues from a Brussels office. And then immediately, just after a couple of days, we could already cover the entire breadth of this business, both in terms of geographies, in terms of scope. Um, and the seller was, was impressed by that. Uh, we had meetings uh, during this month of November in, in Milan. We had meetings in Brussels. And then the, in the end, the signing was, was here in Brussels. And we did a signing with the Brussels team here present, together with a couple of representatives of, of Arden and Didalus with a team in Milan led by Filippo closely coordinated with the clients and with the entire financing work stream. So we basically, again, through that collaboration, uh, made sure that we could cover all aspects and, and again, uh, in, in record speed, sign this transaction. Um, and then signing was on the 1st of December. Um, closing was beginning of May. And then, of course, you realize that COVID appeared within that period. Um, and that we had new challenges. Um, we had to close this in the middle of a, of a lockdown in the entire Europe. Um, but we managed again to do this through collaboration. We had a small team here in Brussels, uh, I think in, in four lawyers from the sellers and here from our, uh, from our side that were, um, that were closely working here physically. And then of course, collaborating virtually with all the teams around the world. Um, so that's how we managed to, to bring this transaction to a successful end with uh, an immense competitive pressure from other bidders um, that, was, that were as keen to acquire this business. 
uh, with a very squeezed timeline with uh, a lot of cross-border aspects with complexity, both in terms of IP arrangements, regulatory arrangements, uh, lots of jurisdictions involved. Um, and in the end, with, with a very satisfied client. Um, and basically, that was only the beginning because um, by the time we were we were finalizing this transaction, uh, Deadless and Audion were already looking at the next one. Um, and that's the transaction which um, Neil and Katharina, uh, you will be talking about. Over, over to you. Thank you. Katarina, they probably heard enough from me. So uh, do, you wanna, do you wanna talk about that one? Yes, absolutely. Um, although first, I didn't know, Filippo, I know you joined us a little bit late. I didn't know if you wanted to chime in before we get into Daedalus. I will do after you, thank you very much. Okay, great. <laughs> um, so as Neil and Gillis mentioned, um, you know, right on the heels of the ACFA transaction, we moved on to the DXC transaction, um, which was one that was done in um, under Delaware law, a US company that had um, branches all over the world. And so, um, you know, we had to do this again on a very compressed timeline, um, working with our colleagues in multiple offices. Um, I think it, there were seven to 10 different offices involved in this, um, covering a number of different issues. And, you know, one, I think, interesting one that popped up during the transaction, just to give a little anecdote, um, is the Works Council in the Netherlands. And um, if you don't know what this is, you're not alone. This was my first exposure to it as well. Um, but essentially the Works Council is an internal body that represents employees and promotes and protects employee interests. It operates almost like a union. And it's certainly not a common feature in the US or in US transactions, but our colleagues in Amsterdam were able to coordinate the entire process, identify the issues, and let us know of any important issues which might uh, require negotiation of the terms in connection with the purchase agreement. So we were able to work closely with them to understand what those issues are, get up to speed very quickly, and then translate that for the client so that they could use it in their business discussions. Um, so, you know, as an attorney based in the U.S., it's exciting and always interesting to me to learn about different legal systems and to see what effects the transactions in which we participate have, not only in the U.S., but elsewhere in the world. Um, and, you know, I, I think it, it's really this this transaction in particular was really interesting to me. I had previously been at another international law firm based in Boston, and I lateraled over to Clifford Chance about a year ago. And since then, I've truly understood what international collaboration means. And I can't think of a single transaction I worked on where it was solely U.S. based and I didn't have to contact a colleague in another office to assist with something that's come up in the during the course of the transaction. And so you know, it, the firm feels truly international and you're not just siloed in your office. And, you know, especially given COVID and the fact that a lot of us are siloed at home currently, you know, that feeling of international collaboration is ever more important. And, you know, even after doing practicing for a number of years, the learning has been exponential, um, which is, you know, that has been a, a real gift. Um, Neil, I don't know if uh, there was anything else in connection with the transaction that you wanted to highlight. I don't. Th I don't think so. Thank you, Katerina. I think you make a really good point. And you know, a number of us are in the U.S. We are still working from home. I know that isn't the case everywhere around the world, but you know, we did this deal in the height of the the global lockdown, and to be able to be on the phone with Filippo in Italy, and you know, I was in New York, but Katerina in Boston. Um, colleagues in the Middle East or Australia just made everyone feel closer together and made it feel as if we weren't just in our own apartments or homes or what have you, but we were truly one international global team and, and, and a team that became, if we weren't already, very close friends and that could smile and enjoy each other's time together. And I think that's a great thing about our firm. I feel that camaraderie shines through to our clients and they can really see 
that enjoyment and that friendship between us. And I think that's really powerful. And I know that Filippo, and I'll give him the floor in a second, um, has had lots of positive feedback from the, the client, the, those that are based in, in Milan, um, about seeing that atmosphere, seeing that energy that I think we create at Clifford Chance that I think is truly special. So, so Filippo, with that, I'll, I will hand you the, the floor. No, thank you, Neil. This is what was one of the, I apologize for my delay in connecting, but this was, uh, I mean, the friendship that and the friendly environment that we managed to create within our team and with the clients is one of the key factors for our success. Uh, I just want to spend two minutes to say that uh, uh, we managed to provide a fantastic assistance to our client and, add, and, and, and adding value, really, because of a number of aspects. First of all, first of all, we understood the importance of understanding the business rationale underpinning the investment strategy of Ardian and of Daedalus. And this was key for focusing on what was really important and providing the most incisive and concrete assistance. This combined with the deep knowledge of the regulated sector provided by Caroline and her team based in Dusseldorf, together with the deep knowledge of uh, different jurisdictions, Belgium, US, amongst the others, has been uh, uh, so important in providing successful and uh, in helping our client, our client in being uh, selected as, as preferred bidder uh, throughout the competitive processes. This is one thing that I wanted to mention. The other thing that I wanted to mention was uh, the importance of uh, structuring the team in such a complex and structured transaction uh, has been, uh, again, key for our success. We had one point of contact from Italy uh, being the point person for the client and being uh, always available to address the queries to the relevant person depending on the practice and jurisdiction involved. Plus, we structure our team with a core team composed of one, two persons from each practice and jurisdiction, which were always aligned and up to speed to the transaction. And we also had a wider team and broader team uh, to make sure that we always had the right person to respond timely to the client queries. The combination of these three layers helped us in making sure that the small team of the client, composed by relatively few people, highly skilled and focused on a number of, of the whole uh, streams of the transaction, were always addressed to the right person. And as I said at the beginning, the last point that I wanted to mention is that, uh, again, both internally and towards the client, we managed to become friends. And this is so important and this has been so much appreciated by the client and, uh, and, and, and helped us uh, in working uh, hard and daily with them in providing uh, uh, the, the successful advice that we provided. Um, I think that uh, we are now, um, we already exceeded our time, uh, unless I'm wrong. You're on mute, Asha. <laughs> Typical error, had to happen at least once. Uh, thank you to everyone that's participated in this panel. Thank you so much, Felipe, for joining us. And thank you to everyone for bearing with us for the, with the, some of the technical issues we had at the start. Um, but I'm sure, um, as many of you will agree, there was a lot of really interesting content in there um, that's really highlighted our uh, strength as a firm, our cross-collaborative um, uh, ability to service our client in the most effective and streamlined way. Now, I know we said that we were going to have an opportunity to go through some of the questions. Uh, at, given that we started a little bit late, what we're going to have to do is get you to save your questions and direct them to our speakers in their speaker booth. Uh, they will be in their booth uh, following the pro bono presentation. As I mentioned, I will come back on after the pro bono presentation to tell you exactly where to go. So for now, thank you everyone that has participated in this presentation. And we will just now start transitioning over to our pro bono panel. Um, and yeah, thank you so much. Let's start getting everyone on. Bear with us.
So I'm on. I'm only gonna unmute when when I talk. You're not muted now. Okay. Hi. Hi everyone. Hi everyone. Hello. Hello. Hi everybody. Uh, we're just waiting for Tom to join us and then we'll be able to start the pro bono part of our presentation. So just bear with us one moment. Oh, gone again. Like, where? Yeah. Yeah. Should be on your phone. No, I can't hear anything. Yeah, but you have. Ah, hi, Caroline. <laughs> and Alex is also there. I didn't see you. Hi. Hi, everyone. Just so that you know, we are still live on the podcast at the moment. We're just waiting for Tom to join us. Just give us one more moment. The wonders of technology. Just. I can see you here. I'm going to Well, we are waiting for Tom to join, but he's having a few difficulties. So, uh, Amy, I hope you don't mind if we move straight into your part of the presentation. If you don't mind kicking off the session, that would be great while we wait for Tom to join. Yeah, of course. I'm actually going to hand it over to my colleague, Whitney, to do some scene setting or stage setting about Human Rights Watch and what we're doing overall. And then I'll jump in after her. Fantastic. Thank you both. Okay, yeah, uh, thank you, thank you, Asha. Um, thank you for having us. Uh, so, hey everyone, my name is Whitney Nusakari and I'm a research assistant at Human Rights Watch. I've been working on universal jurisdiction cases in Europe and specifically on this trial in Koblenz. And joining me today is Amy, our sen senior communications manager at Human Rights Watch. Amy and I want to give you an insight into the work of Human Rights Watch and the International Justice Programme. Um, the relationship between us and Clifford Chance and um, how the exceptional work of Clifford Chance uh, helps us to actually push for accountability for the most serious crimes. So as some of you might know, Human Rights Watch is an independent global organization that defends the rights of people worldwide. We investigate abuses, expose the facts and pressure and those with power. The work yes. of Clifford Chance uh, helps us to actually oops is there <laughs> there was a okay <laughs> okay so um um I, I didn't know where I stopped so I was I was just telling you um that uh, yeah we are that we are pressuring um uh, with the human rights watch is actually pressuring those with uh, with power to respect human rights and um secure justice basically and in order to do so, we conduct regular systematic investigations of human rights abuses around the world, like in Syria, Afghanistan, Greece, the United States, and Myanmar. 
um, the International Justice Program is part of the legal department of Human Rights Watch. The team is actually very small. They are like five full-time full lawyers covering the whole world in pushing for accountability for serious crimes like genocide, crimes against humanity, and war crimes. Um, the goal of the program is to create pathways to justice for survivors. And because of um, our sometimes limited resources, we are actually not able to uh, closely follow developments in international justice all the time. And there's where Clifford Chan steps in. Um, Clifford Chance has been an, like an invaluable partner in helping to bridge this gap and help build this architecture that makes justice a reality for so many victims who have, in many cases, nowhere else to turn. And the lawyers from Clifford Chance helped us not only with answering pressing legal questions in various European jurisdictions, but also provided us with reports on legal frameworks that directly contributed to our work. Um, their knowledge in both domestic and international law have been like yeah, immensely helpful for us in navigating European justice system systems. So um, because this is also about the trial, I want to tell you just a little bit about this, about this trial. For the past one and a half years, Clifford Chance has been monitoring the first trial in Germany in which a, a former Syrian intelligence officials are accused of crimes against humanity. Um, it's the first time that actually state-sponsored torture is tried in court. The trial monitors from uh, Clifford Chance visited every single trial day and provided us with detailed trial session notes on what is happening in the courtroom. Since there will be no protocols or minutes and there are no recordings allowed in the courtroom, um, the trial monitors from Clifford Chance have basically been our eyes and ears in the courtroom in Koblenz, Germany. And this mandate is so significant because it helps bolster the system of universal jurisdiction, which, ha which has been a bright spot uh, in the overall not so favorable political landscape, let me put it that way, in international justice. And um, overall, our team has immensely benefited from the trial report created by the Frankfurt Clifford Chance team. And on that, uh, I will hand over to my colleague Amy, who is now right, um, right now working with these trial reports to tell you a little bit uh, more. Thank you. Yeah, no, thanks, Whitney. That was actually a great summary. Um, yeah, so I am living in these trial notes right now, just so you all know. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about why they're so helpful. So I'm in the commun communications team, which at Human Rights Watch is actually part of our advocacy team because we want to shape the way stories are told. We want to shape the way officials who can actually make changes approach topics or think about topics. And we also want to shape public opinion. And one of the ways we do that is through telling stories. And right now we're thinking with the verdict from the Koblenz trial due to come down December 1st, we're working on a very large project that's overarching about telling the story of this trial and how it happened, how it unfolded. Um, I, every day I'm looking into these notes because I want to know how did the investigation in Germany start? You know, like we at Human Rights Watch know about the abuses in Syria. We do not have an inside view into how investigate, internal investigations in Germany happen. So that's what I'm using the trial notes for. What aroused people's suspicion originally and the person who's on trial? Also, we've done interviews with people who have testified at trial about being tortured, and I had follow-up questions, but you don't actually want to re-interview people about the most traumatic periods of their life because it can re-traumatize them. So I'm able to rely on the documentation that the Alexes have done so I can actually write a good story without having to re-interview people about terrible things that happened to them um, I can look at testimony from people who we have not independently interviewed and take it from this testimony, take it from like the trial notes. Um, and additionally, there's a lot of scene setting and storytelling. And I was able just to ask Alex, who's on the call, as well as another Alex, you know, what was it like in Koblenz, this small German town, to have this 
it's a trial of great magnitude involving everything in Syria. You know, what's it like in this town? What's the tr what's the courtroom like? What what's the setup like? They were able to answer a lot of questions for me that will actually help make the story a lot more engaging, especially to a general audience. And this is all very important because we want to use the story to both to push for justice for Syria in general, as well as to show why these types of trials are important and should continue across countries where they're able to. Thank you. Thanks, Amy. Um, I'm just going to say a few words now. My name is Caroline Kittleman. I'm an arbitration lawyer um, based in the um, Frankfurt office of Clifford Chance. Um, I'm acting as the main contact point for Human Rights Watch in this project, and I'm coordinating the attendance of our colleagues at the trial. We, we're sending one person to cover each day. Um, and so far, we've sent around 15 different colleagues to the court in Koblenz to take notes. And these colleagues have come from all of the practice groups of the firm. They've come from all parts of litigation. They've come from real estate, tax, corporate, finance. So we've really been a, um, a really mixed team. Um, and I'm finalizing the notes that are produced by our colleagues um, in Koblenz. Um, so for each trial day, we're producing a memo. Um, it could be from maybe 10 to 40 pages. Um, and it's it's quite a challenging process because the content goes through two translations. The, the witnesses are generally uh, testifying in Arabic, which is uh, translated into German for the court. Caroline, I think you're muted. You were talking about the three translations. Oh, okay. Is that better? Yeah? Okay. Um, yes, yeah, so we have to try as hard as we can to make sure that we reflect in our English version the most authentic version we can of the testimony that was heard at the court. Um, so far, the trial has been running for 100 days. Yesterday was the 100th day, and we're expecting... Um, the trial to run a little longer, possibly to December 1st, possibly also um, into the new year, um, but it's not really clear, clear at the moment um, when the verdict will be handed down. But I wanted to just share with you two, uh, two insights of mine from, from working on this project. Um, the first is that um, being able to follow the trial meant that I could see firsthand how important the work of Human Rights Watch is, because the Koblenz Court has extensively referred to research products of Human Rights Watch in the proceedings, directly referring to interviews with witnesses, um, information from the ground in Syria that's been provided in reports. And I mean, if you're interested in looking at them, the two main ones uh, the court referred to were uh, If the Dead Could Speak and uh, Torture Archipelago. And so this made it clear to me how, what, a, what an impact the work of Human Rights Watch has on the ground. And, and secondly, it's been, it's been brilliant to be able to be a part of this and to make even a small contribution to the work of Human Rights Watch. And Whitney and Amy and the rest of your team, you're doing such important work. And we're so glad that, that we've been able to support you and that we can carry on supporting you. So um, I'm going to hand over now to Alex um, for his insights on, on the project. Uh, thank you, Caroline. And also thank you to the whole uh, to the whole Human Rights uh, Watch team for, for their efforts. As Caroline said, it's a great, great uh, privilege to be able to helping you. Um, I just wanted to to share briefly some insights that I gathered being in, um, as Caroline and Amy have alluded to, somewhat of a double role, because I was one of the trial monitors when I was a research assistant. And after I uh, passed the bar and joined Clifford as an associate, I kind of stepped into a more uh, coordination role and there are many things I, I possibly could describe about the the experience in Koblenz um, but the one big lesson uh, I took away from it especially um, being a, a uh, in the criminal law division at Clifford and uh, being rather early in, in my career is um, from the interactions with um, the Syrian community who in in rather great numbers are uh, have been attending the trial and, and, and sitting in the public gallery and taking um, 
taking it all in, uh, is that all of us or most of us live in jurisdiction where the rule of law is something that we take for granted that is completely assured to us. And the, the legal instrumentarium that we have as lawyers is something um, we just use um, as a mechanic would use um, their tools. But um, what this trial really, really um, effectively demonstrated to me is that what we take for granted, a function and legal system where arguments are reviewed on their merits and not on your ethnic group, your political persuasion, um, or something of that sort, is not the norm in most parts of the world and something that is completely ordinary and, and um, normal for us um, is the source of, of great aspirations in, in many parts of the world. And I think nothing illustrates that better um, than the reaction on like one of the first uh, days of hearings when the presiding judge asked the main defendant, um, are you comfortable? Is the translation working? Do you need a glass of water? Is everything all right? And just um, treated him, even though he was the defendant, uh, with, with basic dignity. And that was made a, a incredible impression um, on the uh, members of the Syrian community in the in the gallery, and it really showed to me um, that a function justice system is something we should not take for granted, and uh, that requires a, a daily effort to defend against impulses uh, that that seek to to diminish the rule of law, uh, even in in in. Uh, democracies all over the world. Um, so yeah, this would be my big lesson I took from it. And um, with that, I'll uh, hand over to to Kate, who will uh, present to you some of the work of um, Hope and Homes for Children. And I'll we all be happy to to take questions later in the speaker booth. Maybe someone else from Hope and Homes for Children could speak. Hi, everybody. My name is Marie. I, I just want to check if Kate can hear us because I see she's here. Yeah, so, sorry, everyone. Um, my, I was having a few technical issues. Um, I'm new um, to this uh, platform. Um, I just want to say a massive thank you for having us here. Um, I really appreciate um, the opportunity to speak to you today um, and tell you a little bit about what we do at Hope and Homes for Children and our relationship with Clifford Chance. Um, and then I'll hand over to my colleague, Marie, who will talk to you about how Clifford Chance has been supporting um, our advocacy work um, through a number of pro bono projects. Um, so Hope and Homes for Children um, is a global expert in the field of deinstitutionalization, um, or DI for short. And we work by closing orphanages and supporting children into loving, stable families and working with governments to tackle the root causes of family breakdown. Um, decades of efforts, evidence has proved that orphanages damage children's development, um, exposing them to life-changing neglect and abuse. Um, the impact of this can last a lifetime and some don't survive at all. And even the best run orphanages um, deprive children of the love, stimulation and individual care they need. There's an estimated 5.4 million children confined to orphanages worldwide and 8 out of 10 of all these children in orphanages have living parents and nearly all of them have extended family who could care for them with the right support. For all these children there is always a family-based solution. Now Clifford Chance has been a key champion of Hope and Homes for Children since 2009, funding our work on the, on the ground across Bosnia, Romania, Ukraine and most recently supporting our work in Rwanda. And alongside these projects, Clifford Chance has delivered strategic pro bono support that has helped to drive reform across the child protection sector. Um, they've also helped with a range of work, including supporting on our organizational strategy, strategy governance, um, and also taking a place on our board of trustees. 
And over the last three years, um, Clifford Chance has been funding a project delivered by our advocacy team, um, which Marie is part of, um, to, to ensure that the European Union continues to prioritise policies and funding mechanisms, which help bring about meaningful change. As the biggest redistributor of funds across the European region and the largest donor of foreign aid globally, the EU has a prime role in playing um, to play in assuring that money sent to countries for their development targets safer family-based care for vulnerable children. Um, Clifford Chance has been at the forefront of this work um, by helping Hope and Homes for Children's advocacy aims to secure strong commitment for DI and care reform at political level and across the EU's key policies and funds, as well as providing invaluable pro bono work to support this. Um, so I'm now going to hand over to my colleague Marie, um, who will talk you through these projects um, and how important they have been for our work in influencing some of the EU's policies and funding streams. Thank you. Afternoon, everybody. Greetings from Brussels. Um, my name is Marie Graverdil, and as Kate uh, just mentioned, I'm the EU Advocacy Officer at Hope and Homes for Children. Um, I'm part of a global advocacy team of five people working at various geographic levels and uh, within different political areas. Maybe I should start with a few words on our work and uh, then follow up with a sense of how the Pro Bono project with Clifford Chance has been uh, fitting into our advocacy. Um, the global advocacy team is, the, its goal is to mainstream and advance our policy positions and our recommendations to achieve the end of institutionalization of children, uh, which means children li li growing up in orphanages and support and facilitate the transition from institutional to community and family-based care systems globally throughout the world. We concentrate these advocacy efforts on reaching key political audiences at various levels, um, international level, uh, I can mention the UN and in particular the United Nations Committee on the Rights of the Child, as well as the United Nations Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, uh, at regional level, bodies such as the European Union, um, my main point of focus, uh, the African Union, uh, and at national level, where we work hand in hand with our colleagues at the national HHC offices to engage with national and local authorities. Uh, we're also part of several civil society coalition, coalitions, um, along with like-minded organizations who work on children's rights. Uh, and these coalitions can be global or regional, national, local. And in all these fora, whether institutional or civil society, we strive as Open Homes to drive the agenda forward and to bring uh, in our hands-on experience, underground experience. In all these advocacy efforts, we are, Hope and Homes is a notable organization because we do have a rich lived in experience because our national teams work on the ground with children, with their families, vulnerable families, communities, uh, social services, authorities. But experience and evidence is only one part, a crucial one, but only one part of advo advo advocacy work. Um, and. The field of children's rights is passionating, but it evolves very fast. Um, it can be intricate, and we, as HHC, need crucially to keep our experience up to date and in line with legal and political developments at all levels of our advocacy work. Uh, this is central in many ways, but especially in making sure that we're able to speak truth and legal truth to power. Um, on top of our lived in decades long experience. Um, and also make sure that our experience can be translated in the right language to the right audiences and that we're able to identify and raise awareness on specific children's rights infringements uh, at various levels. So keeping in mind the wealth of audiences that we're engaging with in our advocacy, it's an ambitious and at times a very laborious aim. And this is where the work, the pro bono work with Clifford Chance comes in. In the past two years, we have undertaken a specific pro bono project with Clifford Chance where we, the advocacy team, identified 
five areas of legal uncertainties that we called framed as tasks in our daily work. And over these two years, the Clifford Chance uh, pro bono team has been investigating on our behalf and produced these five tasks, um, as we call them. And among them, uh, we worked on uh, legal assessments of children's right abuses in our countries of operation, the countries where we have national offices, in view to contribute to a yearly assessment of human rights made by the EU in partnership countries, uh, countries outside of the EU. We call that the human rights dialogue. And each year, the European Union asks um, civil society organizations to provide them with an assessment of what is going on on the ground. And uh, the EU, with all of their political weight, comes in this um, human rights dialogue and guides partner countries uh, into improving human rights um, uh, nationally, um, uh, compliance, uh, human rights compliance nationally. Um, and, and this has been tremendously helpful. It's a process that comes every year and it's tremendously difficult to keep track of the legal intricacies uh, for a, an advocacy team anyway, um, and to be able to speak legitimately to EU legal teams, basically. Um, we've also worked on an assessment of the obligations of the EU under the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities uh, in the framework of EU external action. Uh, the EU is a well, I'm speaking to lawyers, so I shouldn't say uh, terms I don't understand, but uh, is a, a member of the UN and has obligations. Um, and as an advocacy team, we're, um, we have a, a privileged uh, window to speak with the EU on, on, in this uh, forum. Uh, we've also worked most recently on a legal assessment of the term right to family life, which is a term that we children's rights organizations use very, very often, and which stems from um, good sentiment, a sentiment uh, that, 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 that comes from truth, but is not necessarily um, grounded in, in uh, true legal terms. So we've, uh, we've been um, munching off uh, the, the, the latest task that came through a few weeks ago on this topic. So all these tasks, they stem from a genuine need of legal advice and guidance and expertise from our side. Um, and their completion have truly informed and helped our advocacy evolve. Um, and I want to conclude by saying, and I think on behalf of all of my team, that the pro bono input that we've received from Clifford Chance over the past two years has really fed into our daily work in more ways than one uh, and at all levels. And that we're really extremely grateful for this collaboration. And that infinites a tremendous support in strengthening and legitimizing our voice in advocating for the rights of the most vulnerable children. So um, thanks a lot, Marie. Uh, uh, greetings, um, good afternoon from Brussels as well. I'm Epistemi, I'm part of the antitrust group of Clifford Chance. I mainly work on competition and energy law. And I joined the firm in March 2020, so relatively recently. And before joining Clifford Chance, I worked in various international organizations. So, um, and especially um, at the EU institution. So my work was more policy related it had a more social let's say um, orientation and i really felt the difference when joining a private law firm uh, so uh, working for um, hope and homes and uh, being part of the pro bono team it was really for me fulfilling rewarding i i realized um, the impact that our work can have uh, on, a, on a wider group of people. So speaking from the standpoint of, of a lawyer, I should say that um, um, I'm really grateful for uh, being part of the Clifford Chance Pro Bono team. Um, as I said, it's a really anthropocentric um, uh, work. Um, 
and it, it really gives you the sentiment of offering, of helping. Um, you know, it's not coincidental that the word, the word philanthropic that actually means loving the people. And so indeed, it's a very um, human oriented type of work that sometimes it's missing from our day to day work as lawyers in private firms. And inevitably, we we become more technocratic, more um, cynical sometimes. So this part of work just um, really um, uh, help us finding again our more idealistic part of ourselves and also um, working for really a higher um, purpose. So from my perspective, um, I should say that, uh, and I'm glad to hear from Hope and Homes that our, our work has been um, quite helpful. Um, I also had a completely different impression of institutionalization. It helped me really to change the way I see um, orphanages. And uh, before I thought that it was the best solution for, for children that um, have no families. And it was a really, it, it, it is still an eye-opening um, experience and um, uh, finding out more about the international EU aspects, EU law aspects of um, deinstitutionalization. Um, it's really encouraging and um, uh, I think it gives us much more um, willingness and uh, to, to help Hope and Homes and uh, find more legal arguments because, uh, as Marie said, uh, it's part of the EU um, legislative process and policy making process. So um, I'm really looking forward to uh, working further with Hope and Homes. And um, as I said, it's a really, really rewarding part of our of our work here at Clifford Chance. So being conscious of time, I will now hand over to Gianfranco. Okay, hi. hi to everyone. I'm Gianfranco Goretti. I, um, I've been the president in the last past uh, three years for um, of Familia Corbaleno, uh, Rainbow Families, uh, until five days ago, maybe. So, um, Familia Corbaleno, Rainbow Families, is uh, an Italian association of LGBT um, class parents founded in uh, 2005. Our association's fundamental purpose is to gain legal recognition, protection and right for us uh, as LGBT plus parents and uh, especially for our children. Italian law does not grant lesbian couples or single women access to assisted reproduction techniques and surrogacy is illegal for everybody, homosexual couples, heterosexual couples, and singles. Most couples in familiar Copaleno, rainbow families, have become parents thanks to the progressive legislation effective in several European and American countries. Uh, moreover, in, it in Italy, we still lack same sex marriage. There is only a law allowing a civil civil union. Uh, therefore, in LGBT couples with children, one of the parents is not legally recognized as such. The lack of legal rec recognition weighs heavily, especially in case of contested and conflictual separation, since the legally recognized, uh, recognized parent may may host the other parent from the child's life. Uh, Familiar Cobaleno's foremost aim is to obtain a law allowing both LGBT plus parents to legally recognize their children at birth. Our legal team, working with the Italian Association of LGBT plus legal expert, Rete Lenford, uh, have set out to draft a law which, once passed, will grant our children full recognition and protection. Clifton Change has helped us uh, in this endeavor by carrying out 
uh, in a comparative overview of legislation in, sever in several European countries. Um, Austria, Belgium, France, Germany, United Kingdom, in order to provide our legal team with important input and approaches and help us uh, uh, devise an appropriate solution for our country's specific legal contest. This wasn't the first uh, uh, time that Familia Cobaleno collaborated with uh, Clifford Change. In the past, we have received crucial contribution related to various matters, privacy laws, consultancy for two separate appeals, Familiar Cobaleno lodged with the European Court of Human Rights, an attempt to have Italian authorities recognize foreign birth certificates with two fathers as parents. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, Franco. I'm Ferdinando Poscio, despite the name. I'm a partner in Clifford Chance Department, Global Financial Markets, and I'm based in Milan. I joined the firm 19 years ago now, and uh, as uh, Franco mentioned, uh, Familiar Cobaleno has been working with us for many years now. Uh, we, we value the relationship and we're really happy to have the opportunity to help uh, the association in trying to secure the rights uh, of uh, children to LGBT people uh, and their families. I am a gay dad, so clearly the uh, mission of uh, Familia Cobaleno is very close to me. But I, I would like to point out that generally our people, from partners to trainees uh, and uh, business professionals, have always uh, been very happy and keen to work uh, on uh, pro bono matters uh, for Familia Cobaleno. This has been certainly the case uh, with respect to the uh, comparative research that uh, Gianfranco just mentioned. It was uh, a very collaborative European work uh, that attracted lots of interest internally. Uh, 13 uh, jurisdictions worked on the project. Uh, we have the many colleagues uh, and uh, we were able to put together a comprehensive report uh, and uh, an interactive map uh, that we also plan to make it available to other NGOs and associations advocating for LGBT rights uh, in Europe. The research provides uh, specific inputs uh, for possible uh, strategic litigation in Italy and, of course, in other uh, European countries that have similar problems. And uh, as Franco said, it is uh, instrumental to drafting a bill of law for the legal recognition in Italy of uh, both uh, LGBT uh, plus parents. On general terms, uh, as uh, was said before, I find it very rewarding uh, working on pro bono matters, uh, both uh, professionally and, and, and personally. It is uh, a way to meet uh, different people, to deepen our knowledge in different sectors. Uh, and above all, it, it's a way we concretely help the communities we live in and we try to make a contribution to make this world a better place. And, and for this, I would like to thank you, let me thank you, Familia Cobaveleno, for the opportunity to give us our contribution during the last uh, almost 10 years with them. Thank you very much. I will now hand over to Alessandra that helped us and coordinated the research. Hi, everyone. I'm Alessandra, and I'm a trainee lawyer in uh, the Milan office. And I've been involved in the uh, project uh, with Familiar Baleno and to prepare a uh, research uh, ultimately aimed at uh, giving Familiar Baleno uh, and Redland for the instruments to prepare a bill to be presented to the Italian Parliament. Um, as a trainee lawyer, my uh, role was to help Ferdinand in coordinating the work of our colleagues based in different jurisdictions in providing their answers to a questionnaire um, on the status of the legislation in the different jurisdictions and to help point out uh, the different Budget. points that need education or that were most meaningful to our research. I then helped in um, 
preparing a booklet for our research. And this part of the of my work was uh, a bit more creative and very refreshing as I was also involved in uh, preparing and designing a cover for the booklet. And in this part of the work, I had the opportunity to work closely with our best delivery team to determine the best way to present our research and therefore to make it um, the most um, useful also for uh, other NGOs and as Fernando mentioned, ultimately to also prepare an interactive map. So to really make uh, our research useful and fruitful for, for everyone. And uh, aside, so this also provided me with, with new skills and aside from the learning aspect, uh, I truly enjoyed working on this project as it gave me the opportunity to work closely with various team and with the um, NGOs. And as was mentioned, uh, during our day-by-day -day work, um, we may sometime, due to uh, the long hours and the very high uh, degree of concentration that is required, may feel like we're left with little time to consider the impact um, we as uh, individuals and as a firm can make on um, fostering the um, recognition of rights and driving change. And therefore, I truly welcome this opportunity to work on this pro bono and uh, to put our expertise to the service of the NGOs uh, to work on effective projects. And I truly look forward to being involved in new, uh, to continue this collaboration on pro bono projects. Tom, uh, would you like to step in? Um, NGOs. And yes. as was mentioned, um, and doing our can everybody hear me? Work, I've had some technical uh, problems, due to, uh, the but I, hours I'd like to just thank by, all uh, the speakers the today. To um, like let, let me introduce myself. My name is Tom uh, Dunn, and I'm the pro bono uh, director and here at Clifford Chance. And, um, and there's really two points I want to make about our pro bono practice. Uh, I, I have the fantastic job of, of running the practice and here at Clifford really Chance and there are really I think sort of two key points I'd make about our work one is uh, the scale on which we work really this is a global practice that the firm has with a global strategy that we implement uh, across all of our offices around our network Tom, uh, would you like to step in yeah. um, and, and um, yes. that, that means we're able to operate at scale. We we work uh, with a large number of NGOs around the world. And um, what we've shown you today is just an example of, of that in practice, because working in partnership with fantastic organizations around the world is, is the way we think that we can have most impact um, in the communities where the chance is based. So that's why we structured the session like this. Um, as I say, really grateful to all of our speakers, both Clipper Chance colleagues and the NGOs that we've heard from. Um, I hope you've got a sense of the impact that we're able to achieve through these relationships. And not as important, but, but also to be noted, just how much sort of satisfaction and fulfillment uh, uh, our own people get working with some of these uh, fantastic um, NGOs around the world. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Tom. Um, so I'll just interject there. Sorry, I do think we're having some audio problems there, but thank you very much for bearing with us. Um, so that's the end of the session now. Um, so I just want to say thank you very much to everybody, um, all of our panellists today, um, our NGOs, um, and to our previous panellists on the commercial transaction. Um, thank you very much for everyone who's dialed in. Um, we really hope this has been a valuable session um, and has really highlighted the collaborative nature of the firm. Um, so now it's time for everybody to move to the networking booths. Um, so I have seen a few questions coming in through the chat um, and this is the perfect opportunity for you to direct those questions to, to our panelists and speakers today. Um, so you can access this by going back onto the main page um, and under Expos you'll find um, the booths there. So we've got um, speakers from the Daedalus deal um, and also um, all of our NGOs and pro bono um, speakers today. Um, and also um, you'll be able to network with um, our other European offices um, and 
representatives there um, and lawyers and other lawyers from the region. So um, really hope um, you've enjoyed the event and feel free to, um, to move in and out of these booths over the next 40 minutes. Um, so they'll be open for the whole time and you can move in and out um, of those booths as and, with, as and when you please. So um, thank you very, very much. And we'll join the speakers in the uh, in the booth now.